going on, loungers? Thanks for joining us on another episode of the Retake Lounge. Lucas here with our other co-host, Nathan, and we are happy to be bringing you some really good stuff in today's episode. Um, we, Arguably my most anticipated episode. Yeah. I mean, I definitely for me too. So like when me and Nathan were um, trying to come up with episodes to record because that's a lot harder than you think after 42 episodes. Um, Nathan wanted to break down the history of reticulated pythons, but we, um, it was just a lot of information to gather and we were going to like record that night. And so we kind of ditched it because we also didn't want to be idiots who are just reading through Google and sound like morons. But so we're using information from Glenn McLeland. We are having him on and we are going to do a three part segment of the history of reticulated pythons. And, uh, I'm I'm stoked for it. Yeah, me too. Let's uh, jump right in. I think we have quite a bit of information that we need to break down. Should we also mention that this isn't going to be the only episode breaking yeah. down the history of reticulated pythons? Yeah, three segments. Yep. Uh, we'll let Glenn break that down. But before we yeah. go ahead and bring him on, um, for those of you still supporting, still watching, thank you. I uh, want to just remind you guys, subscribe if you want to know when our episodes come out. They are Friday or Wednesday for early access. If you're on Patreon, hit the notification bell on YouTube. And if you are listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts for this episode, I'm going to highly encourage you to hit pause right now. Go onto YouTube and watch it because we're going to have a presentation with a bunch of great information on there. Whether you're just getting into retics or you've been breeding for years, the first place you want to visit is Stewart Design. More and more breeders keep showing up at shows, on Morph Market, and all over socials. Sometimes it may feel impossible to get anyone's attention. Stewart Design helps small businesses like yours do big things through brand clarity, helping entrepreneurs to start and scale businesses that are easy to know and love. Their work can help any company or industry, but they've done a ton of work for ours. Stewart Design created the brand for US Arcs, Canova, Reach Out Reptiles, Coiled, and dozens of other well-known reptile breeders. Like many of us, the owner of Stewart Design, Blake, is a keeper and breeder who fell in love with retics. Although Stewart Design does a lot of corporate work, Blake has a passion for working with people in the reptile industry. So, wondering if Stewart Design is right for you? Stewart Design can help if you're just getting started or you're ready to take things to the next level. Maybe you're struggling to stand out and build your presence online or at shows. And maybe you don't want to be like the other guys or get lost in the crowd. You want to make your own way doing what you love. You might just have a big idea and know your business is special, but you need help sharing it with the reptile community. If something here resonates with you, reach out to Blake. Have a conversation with him. To learn more or get started, visit sdidentity.com or call them at 855-SD-LOGOS. Clear brand, own markets, Steward Design helps create them. If you are in the market for an enclosure for your reticulated python or any other one of your reptiles, Focus Cubed Habitats is your one-stop shop for not only the best looking cages on the market, but also provide amazing features and add-ons to your cages. We partnered with Focus Cubed Habitats because they continue to innovate and change the way we house our animals unlike any other caging company out there. Their cages are designed intelligently and provide the most stylish and secure housing for your animals' comfort and well-being. Visit FocusCubedHabitats.com for your animals' caging needs. Again, visit FocusCubedHabitats.com for some amazing and stylish enclosures. We also want to thank VivTech Products for being an affiliate sponsor of the Retic Lounge. Stop by VivTech Products for the best UV spectrum lighting on the market that will enhance and improve your snake's overall well being and health. Visit vivtechproducts.com and use the code RETICLOUNGE23 today for 15% off. Again, visit vivtechproducts.com and use our affiliate code retic lounge 23 today for 15 percent off looking for the perfect accessories for your hatchlings or juvenile retics look no further than heli guy serpents 
our sponsor, Chris Sexton, is coming in hot with an amazing 3D printer, creating top-notch perches and other caging accessories for your beloved pets. Enrich your Retix environment with their high-quality products. Use our promo code TRL10 for a 10% discount on your purchase. Visit them today at heliguyserpents.com and start giving your pets the best. Heli Guy Serpents, the premier source for 3D printed caging accessories. Again, that's www.heliguyserpents.com and use our promo code TRL10 for 10% off all of your 3D printed accessories today. Um, but let's go ahead and bring Glenn over real quick. And where is he? Drum roll. There he is. Ah. There he is. Hey, hey. Hello. That was such a wonderful intro. Was... Yeah, we botch him up all the time. Are you talking about yours? <laughs> Mine, yeah. I feel like oh, I need yeah. to go wash someone's feet now to be humble again. <laughs> What's going on, man? Oh, happy to be here. Honored to be here. Awesome. Yeah, we're happy to have you. We've talked uh, here and there about getting you on with all the stuff that you're doing, but... Um, I don't want to tell people about that. So why don't you go ahead and tell people about you? Yeah. So basically my name is Glenn McClellan. That's the most interesting thing about me. Uh, right now I am finishing up my degree in biology and for my senior thesis, I am studying the dwarf and super dwarf subspecies, Maleo Python reticulatus championis. And hopefully, um, by the end of the year, I'll have some version to, uh, publicly share. So hopefully that's on the way. We'll see. Um, and this is kind of a little appetizer, if you will, of what is to come. Um, this specifically will be examining the history of reticulated pythons in captivity. We're going to be breaking out it down into different eras, and those will be different episodes. But tonight we are going to be focusing on reticulated pythons in captivity from the 1700s to the 1970s. The next episode is really going to be about their introduction into herpeticulture, and then the final episode hopefully will be dedicated only to dwarf and super dwarfs. So for those of you who are obsessed with them like I am, you might only want to watch that episode. Or you could watch all three. I love to talk and love to talk about these snakes. So I hope so to see you there. Let, let's talk about you and these snakes real quick. Yes. How, how many do you have at home, Glenn? I only have two. All yeah. right. And two retics. No. Then, no. Yeah. Oh, just two yeah. snakes? Two snakes at all. I have one ball python and then a wild caught male Kalatoa. First retick. First retick, yeah. Man, this guy just went in and jumped in like the 90s. Yeah, I'm just, it's very telling that that's how I went and did it first. <laughs> so let, I want to ask you a question real quick. Yes, how sir? did you convince your professors to allow you to do a thesis on something that they're like, wait, excuse me, what? <laughs> Uh, so shout out to Dr. David Marcy. Um, we lovingly refer to him as the fly guy. He um, studies um, fruit fly genetics. So originally I was a part of his lab um, investigating a novel transgene on the dorsal ventral um, midline of Drosophila uh, Milan, Milanogaster's eye. There we go. And then... Um, you could have said that backwards, and I'd still be like, yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I just saw Lucas and I nodding our heads like, mm -hmm. Yeah. So a very specific project, but it was genetic, so I was interested in that. Uh, one day I was talking to him about what my role would be in the lab for the upcoming semester, and I started talking about these snakes for some reason, because apparently that's all I know how to talk about. And essentially he said, if you want to go do this, do this. So... I am very thankful that he entrusted me enough to partake on it. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing it through and hopefully disseminating that information. Yeah, yeah that's awesome that you had someone that is willing yeah. to back you up like that. Shout out to Fly Guy. Yeah. For for those of you that, that haven't talked to Glenn before or anything, I mean, I've been talking to Glenn now for pretty close to a year. I was sorry. Saying, yeah, no, I, you're, yeah, definitely sorry. Um, yeah. But he... Um, if you guys knew the amount of people he's reached in this country, out this country, and so just the the amount of information that he's going to be bringing with these three segments, um, I'm excited because I actually like when 
Glenn sent me this presentation. I went on YouTube. I went on Google. I started looking for like history of retic stuff. And I don't think like with the three segments that are going to be on here, I don't think there's a more comprehensive single source um, information out there. So this is definitely, I think, going to be uh, for those of you nerds out there, right? Or geeks, I should say, <clears throat> this is going to definitely be um, one that that is going to be good. Yeah. yeah, and this is all pulled straight from Chat GPT, by the way. <laughs> no, in in talking about doing this episode, uh, there there was a point where I was down with some health issues and I was just going through whatever books I could find that uh, dealt with just you know large constrictors or just reptile um, history, that kind of thing, um, and some of the information that you're going to bring up in these episodes are from some of my favorite books and, you know, uh, just compiled. Yeah. Very uh, nicely. That, I think that brings up a great point. Maybe, uh, for a Patreon only video, Nathan and I could do like a book club or a book review. I think nice. that would be fun. That yeah. would be cool because I, as much as I, as like, it's crazy. I don't read like my ADHD is bad. Oh, I, I have to read the same damn you. Um, I have I have to read the same paragraph like over and over for for my brain for it to stick and so but um, but yet like my favorite store to go to is like Barnes and Nobles like I, I want to be able to read so much but uh, so yeah you guys doing that could fill me in well and he took it to another level like I, I'm reading about some of these price lists and other things like just little pieces artifacts from you know the the history of like the late 90s early 80s of reptile keeping and he has them in his hand i'm like yeah. what what the hell yeah yeah <laughs> i'm uh, like i right need here. this in my life this yeah. is that, on we, another level we, we were talking about it on our last patreon live uh zoom meeting and uh yeah this guy just like nathan's talking about like these cool pictures in the book and glenn's like you mean these he literally found them on ebay and got them um pretty cool stuff um especially for someone who's only kept one retake and let me actually ask you i know that you're you're fascinated. You obviously picked your thesis to do it. You've compiled so much information. You're working on an amazing book that you you are going to be publishing. Um, Hopefully, yeah, it'll happen. I think it's it's a really good uh, what at least you've told me. But like, where and when did your even like passion for retics start? Oh yes, this I love this. Um, so when I was growing up, and this is very telling of my generation versus those who came before me, but I live vicariously through people like Steve Irwin, Jeff Corwin, Austin Stevens through a television. I wasn't going out in my backyard and catching garter snakes, gopher snakes, king snakes, anything like that. I would catch the occasional alligator lizard. Those things are mean. Um, but I did not have a background growing up in field herping. So I believe the first time I saw a reticulated python was on Austin Stevens' Snake Master. And he went out into Borneo in search of a man-eating python and found it. And it tried to bite his face off. That's awesome. And for some reason, I said, That's oh, the yeah, snake I the want. snake. <laughs> yeah. And then um, throughout the years, people have been very generous to me, showing me their collections. And then um, once again, living vicariously through those online. That's that's the ultimate form of self control. Lucas always praises me for keeping my collection small, but you've done the ultimate amount of research before getting into yeah. the species. Yeah, let's write a book before you get the snake. <laughs> Jeez, I feel shameful. You should. <laughs> um. All right, Glenn. You ready to jump in? I am so ready to jump in head first. Nathan, into you concrete. ready? Yep, let's do it. All right, give me five minutes. Hold up. No, no. All right, let's go. All right. Brought to you by VivTech. Brought to you by VivTech. Uh, okay, so uh, as I had previously said, this presentation and then episode will be discussing the history of reticulated pythons in captivity. Um, one of the big things I want to give as a warning is that this is a very Eurocentric presentation. Um, Obviously, the Southeast Asian people have been interacting with these snakes for probably tens of thousands of years, um, and Europeans interacting with these snakes is 300 years old. Yeah. Um, but and, because, 
I was gonna say we we always know that white people history is definitely not always like a hundred people, like hundred percent history. Yeah. So, um, just because of the written culture in Europe, all of this has been written down, obviously, and uh, recorded, and then shared even 300 years later so that's why this information is presented in the manner that it is obviously if i had sources from 10,000 years ago i would share them unfortunately i don't okay so um on the next slide here we can talk about the different eras that i'm defining for their captive history um, i broke it up into six different eras um, the two eras that we will be discussing tonight are the 1700s to the 1940s, and then the 1940s to the 1970s. And then, as I had spoke about in the intro, we'll be discussing these other eras in other episodes. So the reason why they're broken up into this is that the 1700s to the 1940s is really characterized by the introduction of reticulated pythons to the West and to science. And then in the 1940s to the 1970s, they are introduced in a meaningful way to America. And then in the 70s and 90s, you have their introduction into herpeticulture. In the 90s to 2000s, you have the morph craze. And then the 2000s to 2014 was the world's first craze. And then 2014 <laughs> to present, what? <laughs> No, I mean, I just like you're you're spot on. Like world's first yeah. craze. I mean, it, we're still even fading it out of that a little bit oh i lived it i'll show i'll find some photos of like they're all yellow snakes but they have six <laughs> yeah, mutations it, in them but it's it, world's first i interrupted you what's the last phase oh i forgot um no 2014 to present is the lacy act and then the rebirth of dwarf and super dwarfs into um essentially a mainstream audience and captive reptile trade yeah i like how you say the reintroduction because yes. these things have been around for ever <laughs> for a long time <laughs> And I think people are starting to know that more, but because they've been so popularized in the last few years, which I think is fantastic. Um, yeah. Anything that's not a ball python, um, I love mine, but let's be honest, there are so many, there's 3,000 snake species or something like that. So um, there's room for one subspecies of reticulated python into the captive reptile trade. So right. yeah, hundred percent. And it is far more responsible to own a dwarf or super dwarf than to own a mainland. Without it, a doubt. Far, far easier to responsibly own, yes. <laughs> that, that's well, a good yeah, clarification. That, that's a, a very good point because there are people out there that are keeping them great. But, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we've said that on this podcast a bunch of times. And, and I love, you know, I'm a locality guy, not so much a super dwarf or a mainland guy. And so even the big localities I love. But, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Okay, so we can go to the next slide and start this little introduction. All right. So the ever handsome gentleman on your right your is striking. No, it's actually your dad. That's why it's in black and white. Ah, uh, gotcha. Yeah. Um, the handsome gentleman on the right is Johann Schneider. Um, he is the first to officially record and name reticulated pythons. Uh, you can like you name them like Joey, Barbara, or like he came up with the name reticulated python. I think one was called your, and the second one was called your mom or just mom. Oh. <laughs> So, so wait, so you're saying he really named them like names? No. <laughs> um, so to... look at the slide, Lucas. Dude, I'm I'm looking on a little tiny MacBook screen. I can't read that shit. Even wearing glasses. He... I'm, I'm asking a clarifying question. I would like yes. the answer, sir. Um, so no, if you're following the Linnaean classification of binomial nomenclature, so genus and species, gotcha. Schneider was the first to record them. He um, named them. Yes, correct. Okay. Even though they've had a name in um, the Southeast Asian countries for probably thousands of years, it's Ular Sanka Kembang. Someone who speaks Indonesian can correct me on that, but um, as a very gringo pronunciation, that was that's what I can offer. You're going to get Indonesian hate mail from how you just, you probably said something really bad. <sighs> yeah. Well, I love you guys, so sorry. Um <laughs> No. So Johann Schneider was the first person to name the species. And interestingly, it's um, he broke it up into two different species um, because of the differences in coloration, their heads, and then their pattern. Uh, this brings up a very good point. Um, 
especially when discussing pure localities in captivity, sometimes you'll see something labeled as a Kalatoa, but it is very clearly not a Kalatoa. A Mindanao Philippine looks nothing like a Kalatoa um, into the untrained eye who hasn't seen all of these localities. Um, it could even be two different species. So this is something that it theoretically could even continue today. Can I ask you a thought? Just yes, while we're talking about identification of localities. Yes, sir. Do you think that people can legitimately, like, almost accurately all the time tell the difference between a Kalatoa Madu Karampa? And and I'm not talking about just animals in this country, right? Ooh, that's uh, very hard, then, if you're making that quantifier. Yeah. Someone might be able to. I can't. Okay. There are differences in the captive representations of each of those localities and the very trained eye can see those differences so like karampas or karumpas whatever you want to call it they've been called karampas for so long i just call them that um have a extremely chaotic neck pattern that probably descends a little bit further than the other two super dwarf localities madus tend to have a wider back pattern and then kalatoas are Kalatoas. Um, yeah. They're the median. The median. Yeah. <laughs> That's a fair That's way, a good to way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Continue, sir. Yes, sir. Um, so he broke them up into two different species, which was very interesting. A few years later, they got brought back to one. There were a couple different name changes. Um, one was to either Boa or Python Schneider. Uh, in honor of Johan here, um, but eventually in 1826, it was changed to Python reticulatus, where it remained accepted until around 2004, where it changed to Broghammerus reticulatus, and now currently it's Maleo Python. So are you just being modest, or was that just a list of proposed uh, name changes that you sent me earlier? Um, it was It was very long and, you know. Yeah, I did not make that. Um, but like Broghammer reticulatus, yeah. yeah. Um, so what's difficult about binomial name nomenclature is that I could write a paper tomorrow and call them super dwarf reticulatus, yeah. but if no one accepts it, um, the main organization that does that is the International Taxonomic Integrated System. I think you can look it up and correct me. Um, but sometimes they will show a specific species name or a specific subspecies name as proposed or accepted. Uh, Jampionis is now accepted according to them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it only took so long. Okay. So here's a question for you guys. Why don't you think that the proper um, subspecies information is known about within the captive reptile trade? four dwarf and super dwarfs what do you mean can you so um most people some people will say only jampeas are jampionis because they're talking about the iulia 2002 paper but then in barker iulia barker they clarify and say it's um reticulated pythons on jampea kaiwadi kalatoa yeah kalatoa um madu krumpa lampo krumpa kiti um Kaleo and Bonarate, but most people don't realize that it's also those other islands. So why do you think that is? So there's a, a paper there that, so there is an updated paper. When was it published? Uh, it's a book. It was published in 2018. You're talking okay. about the Barker and Barker one? Uh, Pythons of Asia in yeah. the Malay archipelago. Yeah. Okay. And so when they, when now that Jampionis is now established as being, you know, accepted, right? Mm -hmm. Was it using data and information from that resource? Honestly, I'm not sure. That's the big question there as well to ask is what paper, what resource were they looking at when they decided to accept the information? But I don't know. I mean, I think, um, I mean, I've definitely seen um, very, I guess, well-respected people in that community um, in the Dorf and Superdorf community have made those type of statements. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe a lot of people refer back to that paper and don't realize that there is a much more recent resource available out there. Mm 
Um, I mean, if you want to ask me and like what the true legit answer is, it's ignorance. Okay. I, I mean, it was the same with me. I thought it was really originally just Championis until mm. I was enlightened with this new resource. Um, I, 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 I feel that it could definitely be broken down. It could be broken oh, further down. You're breaking my heart. I do. You don't no. like. I think that I think the the Karumpa, the Madu, the Kalatoas, like I think those could be a subspecies. And I think you put in Kaiwadi and Jampea into Jampianus, mm-hmm. and then Kalea and then, Bonarate. But we don't have uh, any of those in captivity. Yeah, I would need to see what they look like in the pictures. They're in the I'm middle saying. of so Kaiwadi, Jampea. Mm-hmm. Kaleo, Bonarate, Madu, Kalatoa. No, I know where they. Rumpelompo, I know where they Kitty. are. I would need to. I would need to see an animal from like a picture. Of, oh, yeah. Oh. I don't even have a photo. I know they exist, uh, right? But they, have... yeah, they would have to. It, it would make no sense that yeah. there would be those islands in the middle of Kalatoa and you know Kaiwadi and you don't have animals there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm I'm curious to see which because they're smaller islands. They're definitely not. Um. They're actually fairly big within that um, chain. I'm pulling up. Well, map, oh, when but you're getting I, down wonder- into there. <laughs> yeah, I'm wondering what... Um, there yeah, is I'd one be- fairly small island that I believe Lucas may be referring to. Possibly. But I, I'm curious to see where they would take more of the resemble. I don't know. I just, I see, I, I do, I, I could see it. I mean, when you look at what Australia does yeah. with... Green tree pythons, and not don't get me wrong, they're they're probably very uh, motivated financially uh, to keep things going uh, and research and all that kind of stuff. But um, I mean, I think there's a drastic enough difference between a jampea and a carapa to maybe consider it. Yeah, I see. I see both sides. Like, with all the different localities we have in reticulated pythons and just their span, where do we stop in, you know, scientifically seeing something as a different subspecies or not? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where does it just muddy the waters? I will say, considering that this is Indonesia, um, I will say that just the fact that we have Jampianus, Saputriae, and Malayu Python reticulatus, I would say we're doing pretty good. (laughs) Uh, yeah, <laughs> I guess so. They're just the research hasn't been done elsewhere. Yeah. So I think it would be far easier to make a case for Mindanaos to be their own subspecies or the um, Malukus. Oh well, yeah. I, I thought we were just talking about that island chain. Of well, course. Yeah. Like definitely, like Malukus are in Malukus and the the uh, the the southern part of the Philippine Channel with the Malukus. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. They look like uh, they have some Sulawesi type of influence, but they kind of break a little bit apart from the evolutionary track that you see. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a great video on that um, yeah. that that uh, someone's done on just kind of the three main breaks of evolutionary. But anyways, yeah. I mean, there's definitely more subspecies and retakes that need to be done. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was because you guys are very invested in the captive reptile side of things. I was wondering your take because that's the easiest source of crossover for science and herpetoculture. I think for the general person getting into reticulated pythons and not looking to make it a business or anything, I I think there's a, a level of research that just doesn't go into it. It's just mm-hmm. more let me keep this animal. I would rather someone focus on keeping it alive, keeping it well, than knowing what the scientific name is. Exactly. Well is definitely the key word there because it's really if, easy. If we to can keep push for both, though, like that ultimately will end up in better husbandry, I'd imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Okay. Um, so you can click one more, Nathan. Okay. Maybe. There we go. Good job. Um, and then something you're going to see time and time again in this presentation is that reticulated pythons were used for their shock factor because there is nothing more impressive than pulling out a 20-foot snake that could eat you. I'm sorry, but is that not, not what we're all doing to a degree still? Oh, well, 
You'll see. You just haven't gotten that far in the PowerPoint. Come okay. On. Sorry. Oh, come on. Okay, you can go down to the next slide. So this other very handsome gentleman on our right is Alberta Seba. He is my personal hero. Um, he sounds like he went to Hogwarts. He was the, actually the first headmaster. I didn't know you knew that. Um, Thanks for entertaining me. You're so welcome. I'm here all night. Um, in that photo, or sorry, depiction of him, he is holding a lizard in a jar. So uh, reptiles in general were a very um, specific source of interest for him. So you can um, hit down a few, Nathan. Thank you, good sir. Okay, so Don't Albert is sober. That's good. That's good. He's no. He knows what he's doing. Good job, Nathan. Um, he probably was the first person to keep them in captivity. Um, I don't know if he was able to keep, if he got them alive or if he got what's called a holotype. So that's when you're using an example of a dead, um, specific in this example, snake, um, to describe it. I don't know which one he had, but the way he got them was through interactions with merchants, um, sailors, other traders. He was a pharmacist. So he needed, um, at this time, um, needed those medicines from the Orient, essentially. Like, that's to use that terminology from the time. Yeah. Um, so that's why he had these interactions. And then he had a personal interest in documenting the natural world. So that's why he kept uh, stuff like this. Um, and that was when? What year? Sorry, again, I can't uh, read. Yeah. 1665 to 1763 is when he lived. Cool. So to give a little bit more historical context. Oh, and that's just something I should have said at the beginning. Um, I know all of this seems very not pertinent, but it all lays the groundwork for where we are today. Without these people's work, we would not have this level of understanding, level of interest of these snakes. So yes, I know we are talking about people from the 18th century, but... I think it's important. Well, 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 this is this is still just laying the groundwork for the exciting stuff to come. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I know it could be like um, kind of a, a boring subject, but still. No, no, important. you're good. If, and I, th if, I think if you are passionate about anything, diving into the history is really important no matter what subject. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, and look at the Green Tree Python world. Yeah, man, still... Um, but what I was going to, I mean, at this point, there are so much people out there, like new people wanting to come in and breed and everything. And I mean, um, uh, let me tell you what, if you definitely want to stand apart from other, this is good shit to know. <laughs> you know, I have to give, um, Spencer credit. I, he posted something the other day on Instagram of like, what would set apart a breeder for you? It's his enclosure. I liked it. Yeah. It was I like that. a very good post. So I didn't so, see the results when I had clicked on I it. I, I I saw that at the time there was like a twelve to fifteen percent increase, uh, or the one winning by about fifteen percent was uh, uh, online presence and uh, respectfulness. That was over enclosures by about fifteen percent or something. But uh, I actually I actually voted in that earlier today, and uh, the only one closer to enclosures was uh rare genetics and localities or something oh so like it that. switched up yep okay cool so shout out to spencer yeah he's doing it right we need more people like him doing it right so i mean he knew the answer to the question he, he, he inspired he inspires people new and old to this industry and openly like i see people who i've looked up to saying these are the enclosures that i want to yeah have. he's so, doing it yeah. he's, he's doing it right he came in with a bang and didn't shortcut yeah, so we need more people doing that. Um, we don't need more people mass producing mainland reticulated pythons. Any I, reticulated I would much rather python. see specifically mainlands because that. Sure, I, I still on think, the scale. I I still <laughs> think a, a nine ten foot super dwarf it can just as easily be neglected. And not just oh, neglected, yeah, I mean, not, not just neglected, yeah. but I mean the the risk side of behavior, feeding response, and all that kind of stuff. You start mass producing super dwarfs, and you have mom and dad going to, 
you know, a reptile shop with their, their eight year old kid. That's like, Ooh, I want one. And now, now because we're mass producing, you have way too many. We're selling them for 300 bucks. Yep. And n- yeah. now anyone can get a retake. And even if it's an eight foot retake, that shit will still light you up if you're not ready for it. <laughs> I mean, unfortunately it may have killed people. Um, right. So. Is that in the history? No. Oh, okay. I, All right. Trying to be respectful. That's that's true. Um, but this, still, this would be a dark that, podcast if we were just going over reticulated python deaths throughout history. That's okay. gonna be I have some. segment four. <laughs> There's a comment, list comment, comment, I have a folder. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> comment down below if you want to see segment four. <laughs> no, please don't. Patreon exclusive. Um, <laughs> no, but back to the point of overproduction. Um, I. I'm not seeing it to the full extent in super dwarfs right now that we used to see it in like the early 2010s with reticulated pythons. So I'm very pleased with that. Um, but it's something to be cognizant of going forth. Glenn, you're a smart man. If you don't think that we're getting there, we have to have a talk. I don't know. Next slide. Um, yeah. <laughs> no. Wait, wait. I mean, Did yeah. we get through all this information? I, I... No. Oh, yeah. gosh. No. Okay. So Seba was um, mostly known for his Wonder Common or Cabinet of Curiosities. There's actually a podcast um, by Aaron Mankey called uh, Cabinet of Curiosity. So it's a term that is still relevant in the zeitgeist. Um, basically, Cabinet of Curiosities are a, a collection of things. To put it very simply, usually it was a mix of artifacts from the natural world and then cultural artifacts. And then essentially you would have a cabinet or a room, whatever, with all of these different artifacts and come show your friends. So, you know, today that's going into your snake room, showing all your buddies your slightly different snakes. I I have a little display case of different specimen skulls and things like that. Funko Pops? No, no, no. A full-on glass display case. Of your Funko Pops? Oh, uh, soon-to-be Funko Pop collection. I'm going to trade in the skulls. The, g- the Gaboon Viper skull can make way for a Mandalorian Funko Pop. Oh, my God. How much longer am I on this podcast for? Um, <laughs> Two more segments. Go... <laughs> uh, okay, you can uh, go down a few more. Okay. Um, one of my favorite facts about Seba was that one of his or his entire collection of um, curiosities was purchased by Peter the Great, uh, the Russian Czar in 1716, which speaks volumes about its quality and how recognized he was within this um, cultural subset that his entire collection got bought out. So after 1716, he started to rebuild his collection. And then you can hit two more. I love one hearing more. the... Uh, yeah. Where where was Seba from? The Netherlands, I believe. Okay. I, I love hearing the term collection being used in reference to the 1700s. Like it's just I, a cool it's is, a cool concept. Yeah. Oh, oh. It, oh gee, Nate, no, oh, Nathan. Blowing the load, I know. One more. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what um, one thing I want to talk about real quick. I, I don't know if we just didn't get to it yet, but. Bolin's pythons? Oh, my f- favorite. Where's Ari? Wait, do you see that on the slide? Because again, it's too small for yeah, me. Yes. Yeah. So, do I need to read for you? No, I'm going to let me, I'm going to open it up on my phone and I'm going to follow along. <laughs> Son of a. We don't want um, Lucas to look illiterate this episode. I just don't want to squint all freaking episode. It's I'm not like hard. leaning into my mic. <laughs> That's freaking. Rude. Well, what was your question about Bolin's pythons? No, Sorry. I'm just, I'm just impressed. I, I know, even within modern herpticulture, that people have had problems keeping Bolins alive. So just, I mean, yeah. I don't know that he necessarily had live specimens because it looks like, you know, he definitely. Yeah, probably I, not for those. Yeah, but I mean, it's interesting that people were already collecting Bolins even back in the early 1700s. Mm-hmm. There's, I'll maybe I can find it and send it to you guys after the show. But there is a depiction of Boland's pythons in um, his thesaurus, which is the next point. But 
Um, I mean, even 300 years ago, people were just as obsessed with Bullens as we are now, but he didn't have an Instagram to flex on. So he flexed <laughs> everyone by making it thesaurus. Um, and left his phone number in the back. Um, so, uh, during these 20 years when he was rebuilding his collection, a big portion of what he got were different snakes. Um, so he was probably the first person to keep ball pythons in captivity. Um, other snakes all around the world. So you have ball pythons from, uh, West Africa, um, anacondas from, south or central america i'm not exactly sure um do you guys know on on where anacondas anacondas are? yeah is it central or south america i believe so what okay, okay. Or, no, no, wait wait say the question again are are anacondas what is the range of anacondas central, uh, I, that i'm not totally sure of i want to say south america oh it's got to be south america it's uh, it's yeah. south america there's bolivian there's uh, there's Peruvian, there's Brazil, there's okay. Equ- Ecuador. Um, Thank you. Okay. I don't think they go to Central America. But if you guys know, let us know. Yeah. Thank you. Please. Um, so, West Africa for the ball for pythons. The episode, Lucas. What? Yeah. <laughs> I said that's helpful for the. Episode. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah, for the. Yeah. If you guys know, let us know in like a week and a half from now. <laughs> Uh, that's if we even get through this right um, no so west africa for ball pythons south america for anacondas you have rat snakes which would be the southeastern u.s indian pythons that's self-explanatory sand boas um kenya tree boas which would be south america um Bolin's pythons which are papua new guinea and many more including our beloved reticulated python in these 20 years, what he was doing was amassing a collection to publish um, his cabinet of curiosities to a wider audience because they were so popular. So if you couldn't go to his house or whatever, you could still see his collection by um, purchasing this thesaurus. So if you want to go down to the next slide, um, there is a depiction from his thesaurus of our beloved reticulated python with a royal python and then a scarlet ibis that is ibis definitely a super dwarf and oh of course yeah and, and that actually ball... from the back pattern it's a kroompa kitty the, one, <laughs> the very small one and i will say that ball python's throat looks like some of those leaked photo of slither exotics animals Ow. too soon <laughs> sorry you're gonna have to come true I, uh, true but yeah, especially the lower portion of that jaw. All right. Next I'm not slide. Cutting that out, Glenn. <laughs> no so problem. when when I was originally looking at this, uh, when you sent it over, I don't know if this is supposed to be it says a Python reticulatus at the bottom with a question mark. To me that looks more like a boa. A boa. Who knows? I mean I, what what kind of boa does that look like to you, Glad? Oh, no. I don't know. I don't know anything about uh, any other snake beyond super dwarf. Why am I spacing on the name of it right now? Like a Doom, Doomerals. We yeah, Doomerals. Oh. They look like Doomerals quite a bit. I I mean I will say it does have a red tail. Eh. I'm red green colorblind. I don't see that. Maybe one. it's an ocelot retic. <laughs> but i mean I, just the reference of of that resource and how it has that reticulatus on the bottom question mark is definitely um i mean just another artifact that shows the date of how old people have been looking at these animals and drawing them mm-hmm and then if you want to go to the next slide, yep. Uh, in the top right-hand corner, we have a depiction called Plundering the Tower, and that's in the context of the Tower Menagerie, which was in uh, London, England. And I don't know if you can see it, but um, the man depicted there is holding a, I believe, lion. So it was a pretty hardcore zoo there. You can uh, hit a hit three. Yeah, there you go. 
So um, the first time that I can tell reticulated pythons were kept in a zoo was at the Tower Menagerie, like I said, in London, um, England, in 1825. So Schneider had only described the species 24 years before, and they were already making their way into European zoos, which is, I find, very interesting. Um, they brought in six boa constrictors from Java, um, <laughs> And we know there aren't boa constrictors in Java. I was going to say, wait, Glenn. <laughs> yeah. But those are in Central America. Yes. Thank you, Lucas. Um, no, but in that source I cited there, um, it's further clarified that it was likely reticulated pythons, um, even though they were called boa constrictors. And that's a very important point I make in that next um, bullet point where they were called boas for so long. Um, I mean, their original name was Boa Reticulata or Boa Rumbata. Um, and you'll see later on in the presentation that there are more examples of them being called Boa Constrictors. So it's also difficult to draw conclusions about their captive history timeline because of the change in names. So. Fair good. point. Yeah. It's like um, dwarf and super dwarfs. Right. If you don't know what those are, they're actually island localities. Um, so, right. You know, people are still Fun making fact, this. Yeah. All you retic breeders out there, you actually have boas. <laughs> Originally, I'm not going to argue that point. Uh, okay. So, the first reptile house opened at the London Zoo in 1849. So, this would be largely seen as the first reptarium. Kind of Oh yeah, dude. I want to turn my house into a reptarium. The, the first rep the, the first reptarium ever made. Yeah. Brian Barjack has to watch his back. No. Right. <laughs> Come on. They did this in eighteen twenty. Um That's pretty yeah, damn cool. Yeah. So um I don't know how much of that photo you can see, but there are I believe a lion there. There's um monkeys or a different it's primate. Like a freaking elephant in the back just chilling inside oh, yeah. someone's house. <laughs> Hey, that was the Times. Or that was at the Royal Menagerie, not the um, London oh, Zoo. Oh, true. Pardon me. Okay, fair um, And then um, in France, a um, <laughs> bit of time later, you have um, the Pavilion des Reptiles opens up. And then if you hit one more, Nathan, um, we know that both of these zoos and then eventually their reptile houses had pythons. We don't know if there were reticulated pythons. I can't find... Um, specific records of what they were keeping at those times, but we know that they had pythons. So, I mean, All right. it goes back to people hundreds of years ago were just as interested in these snakes as we are now. Oh, Nathan. I know. I, it was my bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now we're going to talk about a subject that, once again, plagues us to this day, that reticulated pythons are seen as sources of entertainment. There is some merit to this, obviously. Um, like, for example, that Austin Stevens show, um, had I not seen him get his face almost bitten off, I probably wouldn't remember it or know what reticulated pythons are. So there is some value, and there is a great amount of value in doing it properly, but um, yeah. that's not always like, the case. Like, I'm actually a fan of clickbait. Like when clickbait is used um, uh, appropriately in the sense of, you know, a big uh, image for a YouTube thumbnail of a, you know, big teeth. Let, let's think of like a, a emerald tree bow and how big their teeth, you blow that up, but then you get to actually watch the video and people who want to see this big snake bite someone or something and they actually get to watch an educational content and learn like I'm totally about using them for entertainment as long as we're, you know, not shooting ourselves in the foot. Exactly. Yeah. Um, did you have any thoughts on that, Nathan? You look like you want to talk. I mean, uh, similar as Lucas. I mean, I, I think there's good and bad that goes into all of it. Uh, social media being as big as it is, I don't think we need to con continually fuel the fire when it comes to stuff like bite videos feed videos things like that i mean you have a personal example of a reticulated python as a source of entertainment yep so yeah. yep for better or for worse 
and not proud of it. <laughs> Glenn, I, it go, could be worse. Yeah. That's what it boils down I mean, to. It, 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 really, it really could be. And I'll, I take it as that and just don't continue to put out that you know, yeah. type and of I mean, and I, if I'm not mistaken, Nathan, you took it down on all your platforms and you did what you could at that moment to to kind yeah. of get rid of it. At least yeah, I can't aspect. find it. Uh, it. It still pops up in, in different places, but it, it's it, it is hard, really to, hard find. to find. I, I've tried finding it myself, so that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. But I mean, so for example, I would much rather that video go viral of you having a very nonchalant reaction to a bite versus a photo of someone being it, eaten in Indonesia by a reticulated python. <laughs> exactly. Oh my so, gosh. Talk you know, about extremes. I know, but I mean, they are both very shocking videos. But when someone shows that, shows a more, I almost want to say professional side to it. Because mm. he didn't overplay it from what his description of it has been. Um, so I'd call Nathan a professional. Yeah. You're so professional. Nathan. I was just caught off guard and I said, hey, to my snake. That's all that happened. <laughs> I, that's the best way to react to it. So good for you. Stop. It's, it's better than me. I freaking walk in my garage, and if a snake slams the glass, I freaking jump. I'm like, shit. Yeah, me too. <laughs> okay. Um, so back to the original point reticulated pythons as sources of entertainment. Um, in 1805, um, this is probably the first example I can find in the literature of a reticulated python being a source of entertainment. Um, George Wombell purchased two of these reticulated pythons for 75 pounds. Um, he ran like a roadside show, and then in a couple slides, we'll look at his uh, show bill for them. Did but, you have any research into what inflation of that price would have been? No. But it, interesting. That, that's something I'll look into. Okay. Yeah. So. I did it at one point, and I've forgotten it. So. Okay. Look it up, Nate, or look it up, Lucas. Um, but basically, even back then, people were being uh, shocked by these snakes. This theme has continued on to the late 1800s into the 1900s, where big snakes, mostly Burmese pythons, were used as um, entertainment because reticulated pythons typically aren't the best source. Um, if you have someone handling them and it's running around or whatever, and then you have a Burmese python who couldn't care less about anything, is just sitting there and you can throw it around someone's neck. So reticulated pythons weren't as prevalent as, say, Burmese pythons, but they still played an outsized role. I mean, you still see the same theme today. Yeah, <laughs> my local fair has um, some guy with an albino berm that pulls up and lets everyone hold it. Everyone thinks of Britney Spears, too. That's a... Oh, come on, dude. Go to the next slide. <laughs> you didn't give me my segue, though. Okay, go back one. Go back one. Oh, Come on, dude. Um, so what I was eventually leading to is that oh. women, in particular, in these roadside shows, would be portrayed as snake charmers. Um the photo on the right here, I don't have a source for it, but it is a lady in the early 20th century um, holding a reticulated python. Um, she is dressed very commonplace for that time. However, if you did more research, you can see what I'm talking about. Um, very scantily clad, um, very revealing clothing, which would have been atypical for that time period, furthering that shock and awe. Um, that would have been associated by seeing a large constrictor. And that, I, that still continues in modern freak shows. They'll have snake mm -hmm. charmers and, you know, yeah, scantily yeah. clad, you know, belly dancer kind of outfits. So I found the number. Okay. So the pounds, so 75 pounds back then would have been worth 6,595 pounds in 2020 which would equal eight. Yeah. What does that equal in freedom dollars? $8,139. God bless America. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So that's how much he paid. Sweet. Well, speaking <laughs> of. <laughs> I was just 
just do what I was told. Okay. Yeah, use that defense. Um, go to the next slide, please. Yeah, once again, doing what he's told. Just slowly. Um, so we have the incredibly famous, um, it would be the photo and video from the 2001 MTV Awards where Britney uh, Spears came out with an albino Burmese python, I believe named Sunshine. Um, I'd have to double check, but... That's correct. Thank you. Um, that is a very ubiquitous assumption for um, women being portrayed alongside snakes. Fun fact, Britney Spears lives very close to me. Fun fact, did you hear, well, it's not a fact, but did you hear these theories going around that she's actually dead and it's AI in her videos on Instagram? Oh, that's so fake. But you know that... Um, Glenn knows where Paul her McCartney. Is. He does okay, daily actually, health do. checks on her. <laughs> I can't say any more to that. I'll tell you guys more about that afterwards. Uh, but there is actually a degree of truth to it. Not me, but someone I know. Um. All right. I believe you're missing a slide because I did it better than Brittany when I uh, did my Pit Viper photo shoot. That's cool, dude. Yeah, that was cool. I had to give you props for that. Um, so this is a very corrupted uh, copy of the show bill in that came out of... Murphy and Hender Henderson's Tales of Giant Snakes. But it is a show bill from the aforementioned George Womble. Excuse me. And as you can see, it says Boa Constrictor in there. Yep. Yeah, that's like the headline right there. I mean, even bigger yep. than Hooded Serpent, which I'm assuming is a cobra. Yeah. Yeah. So once again, he had two large reticulated pythons, and we're showing them off. You can advance one more slide, Nathan. And this one is a little clearer, but you have a depiction of some large constrictor killing something. Um, I can't see it from here. But once again, um, displaying these large constrictors that someone in England could come see. Um, and the largest snake in England is like three feet. So to go from seeing three foot snakes to seeing a 20 foot one is a large jump. Very much so. Yeah, you, it looks like a horse or a deer from my perspective. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Okay, you can go to the next slide. So um, the 1940s to the 1970s is what I am characterizing as the next era. Um, this is really shown by the addition of reticulated pythons into the U.S. zoological setting. Um, as you can see on the right is a photo of the world-famous Colossus. Um, which has been claimed to be the longest snake in the world. Do you guys know Colossus? Have you heard of it? I've yeah. heard the name, but I, I'm not sure. Like how isn't it around 30 feet? They claim. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was 20 feet 10 inches, and it was a male. So that's a very big male. Um, very big. He man. was from Thailand, um, and the Highland Park Zoo actually had another massive Thai import. Um, before Colossus, but Colossus really took the cake. Um, a lot of those in early um, imports during this era were from Thailand. And then that continued a little bit into the 80s, and then it changed. Uh, it's very interesting to look at the legality of importing. So like the Mindanao, or just Philippines, they stopped importing in like the 70s or 80s. They banned it, so. Oh, yeah, yeah. The the one thing that really impresses me about this picture and just maybe the husbandry back then, and especially for you audio listeners, this is a good chance to jump over, but this is a photo of Colossus back in 1960, and this is the supposed 30-foot snake perched up in a tree. Yeah. A grossly overweight snake perched up in a tree. Yeah, so... The, the fact that we're debating that now is just hilarious to me. Yeah. I, I, I mean, it's just, it's the power of our mind, right? And I've said this in other episodes before. It's like the people who want the really big retics, right? The people who are all about the giants, they're always going to overestimate, right? Because, and not necessarily always to be uh, uh, deceiving, but because, you know, they are really big and they look big. And then it's the opposite. For those of us that, that uh, for those that keep super dwarfs, I can't tell you how many times I see people posting a picture of here's my three year old Kalatoa five feet and it, the snake is clearly about six and a half foot. Right. And so, um, yeah, I just think that it's the power of the mind. I don't even think people always do it like intentionally. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, exactly. Although um, 20 to 30 is a big jump. Yes. So um, I've written about this and I've explored it in my thesis, but the difficulty in measuring, especially a live snake. So when you skin a snake, you can stretch the skin up to, I think, 33%. Um, and then when a snake sheds, it's anywhere from 10 to 20% longer um, because it stretches. So it is very difficult to find an accurate representation of how long uh, these snakes are. Yeah. Uh, yes. So this is the area where you start to have famous snakes like Colossus in zoos. Um, there are other snakes, but none quite are, um, they don't quite hold the imagination like Colossus did. Um, but the, it is a continued trend of having very large snakes be called the world's longest snake. Um, that's even continued today. Yeah, um, with Medusa. Yeah, I think, okay, that's the name I was looking for. Uh, yeah, Medusa's huge. I don't know how big she is, but huge. Okay, and then from the um, that era where there were snake charmers and roadside shows to the 1960s, um, giant snakes in captivity were mainly in the hands of road shows, exotic dancers, showmen, and zoos, mostly because of their size. So once again, on the right, you have the father and son team of uh, Marlon and Ross Allen um, wrestling a... Um, anaconda in their man-made lake i was gonna there. say that looks like they're underwater yeah um so i hope we won't get copyrighted for the next video but it's a very fascinating look i believe it was in 1957 um when someone went around and filmed the ross allen reptile institute and he's wrestling an alligator he went underwater wrestled an anaconda and he really was the forefather of her pediculture he wrote a book called how to keep snakes in captivity um, because it was so foreign during that time that's a that's a book that i've wanted to add to my collection yeah i don't know if it's so out of date it's highly expensive but i need to add that too yeah so, next next slide sure yeah if you All can right. uh well i tried there we if go. you can't it's okay yeah and then can you access the video from there uh try clicking on it Yes. There you go. So we don't have to watch all of it, but um, this is a 12-minute video that's in the public domain of um, a visit to Ross Allen's place. Here, um, I believe he's getting in the water to wrestle an alligator. You can um, fast forward just a little bit, Nathan. And you said this is his own lake? Oh. So this was his um, I, reptile park. Okay. So, um, like that one is clearly, I'm assuming it's a man-made lake. Maybe I shouldn't be so bold. Bro, just <laughs> can yeah. we talk how he literally swam towards that alligator and scared the alligator away from it? Very different techniques than you see today with alligator rescue. Just a little bit. Dude, that you gotta have some. Deal. It's some WWE moves we're seeing right now. Right. Uh, that's and, pretty fun. Yeah. And if you fast forward to um, watch. Yes. He's doing the same thing with an anaconda underwater with his son. Let's see. Yep. Oh, <laughs> that's my the way too insane. far. Yeah. That is a picture of the insanely racist practice where um, they collected people from the Amazon and had them live in like a replica of their village. Okay. For oh, yeah, I think it might be watch. further in the video where he does. That's the like that's like that's this. like keeping people in captivity and yeah, replicating their environment. Is. That's like what yeah. we're trying to do with retakes now. And this, this is a venomous okay. snake pit. That's a coral snake, and he grabs it, which is, oh my god, that is scaring me Yeah, so if you've uh, Venom Doc, which is a great uh, book about just venom research, uh, you can hear about coral snake bites, I think it's, it's not fun. I think it's something like 80% of coral snake bites end up being lethal. Don't mess around with a coral snake. They don't, they're not inclined to bite, but that doesn't mean you grab one. No. Um, where's this video of him wrestling this freaking... 
hundred foot anaconda. I don't know. <laughs> it was back further. I swear. It got ri- right to the racism really fast, Glenn. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what are you setting us up for? Failure. <laughs> <laughs> Direct and to the point. Um, All right. Yeah, I, I don't quite know. I think it's a little after that. Yeah. And then he does the tonic immobility thing. Is oh okay. Um. I mean, at, at this point, well, there's him with a boa constrictor. Mm-hmm. And I don't think he had any reticulated pythons. I should be clear. I haven't found any record. Um, okay. He might have had them. I don't know, but I can't find. Okay, here you go. Yeah. Oh. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. Anyway, yeah I'll, I'll back up a little. No, bit. no, no. It doesn't matter. Okay. Well. Anyways. Now we can monologue over it. How's your guys' day going? Well, Good. I'm watching two shirtless men on on the boat, so not. <laughs> yeah, too bad that's something right new now. for you. <laughs> just look at the size of that monster it is i mean are you talking about the guy or the snake? Oh, sorry audio <laughs> listeners we're talking about a snake here that is a pretty big anaconda yeah that's got to be at least eight to ten years old <clears throat> It constricts them at one point. Yeah. Nice. That's about right. That's I, I would constrict you too if you just grabbed my head. And then threw you into water and then wrestled you. Right. Yeah. Like the snake's chill. It's like not hating on him. And then he puts it into the water and just jumps right on it. You can, it's trying to get away. <laughs> the entire <laughs> time. But yeah, I mean, this is all for show. Yeah. Oh, without a doubt. Um, that dude, bold freaking move with just you know the whole concept of constricting and you're kind of in its territory in water <laughs> i i swear to god Vic, vince mcmahon was inspired by all these videos no kidding <laughs> so that just speaks to how entertainment it, yeah for better or for worse they're very entertaining it's something about near-death experiences that just keeps us on the edge of our seat. Every time I go through Taco Bell, I relive it every time. <laughs> it's that roll of the dice, baby. Oh, no, it's not even a roll. It's like a... Never mind. Um, I'm going to finish that thought on air. <laughs> uh, oh, so... wow. Yes. So, wait, are there anything else that you guys would want to cover on this topic before we close for the night? Uh, no, I mean, I, I just wanted to say, so, um, I mean, I'm really excited for the next two, uh, segments that we're going to be doing. And I think a lot of people are going to find that that's a lot more up their alley. But again, mm-hmm. I mean, I think that you can't start there. You definitely need to understand, um, where this whole captive keeping. And I, I think, you know, again, I'm a geek, so I like going back and knowing that this stuff started this early, but, um, Super important information because I think it sets up the uh, sets up that next era, that next segment that we're going to do to how just kind of the industry has grown. Yeah, Glenn, I I just want to thank you just because you know I I had done a tiny bit of research myself and didn't feel like there was a ton of information out there, but you definitely There's expanded. Not. There's not, but there's a lot that you've even expanded on. Um, which I really appreciate. So I think this will be really cool when it comes out in full form. Yeah, I, I hope so. Yeah, no, again, thank you. I don't even know how you managed to get your hands on a lot of this information. So if this wasn't one of your favorite retic lounge episodes, you're wrong. <laughs> you're wrong. You're wrong. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking forward to the next two as well. Cause I, I feel like as we start to get closer to like the, times that we've kept or like what inspired us and those kind of things um uh we'll get to talk more shit about it so yeah man it's it's awesome having you on here the level of knowledge is insane and then like you're just cool on top of it so oh yeah Uh our listeners will appreciate it for sure so let's go ahead and um drop glenn's plug on that next slide so he can go ahead and 
Yeah, so this is really an opener instead of a closer. Ladies, um, any day or night, you know, PM dawn, AM dawn, DM me. They are open. I am willing to chat. If you want a friend, a shoulder to cry on, don't worry. I'll be there. I will listen so well. I won't mansplain to you like I just did for an hour. Um, you know, don't worry. I'm there for you. Same. Everyone else, um, I think I'm in the mail book. <laughs> um, good luck. Yellow pages. Um, I think carrier pigeons still come to my house occasionally. So uh, that's a good way to find me. But ladies, DMs are open. <laughs> I love it. That's been by far the best outro that we've Thank had. You. The, best, the best exit. Um, Glenn, again. Uh, we said it already, but thanks for, for coming on tonight. Uh, for those of you that tuned in and got to uh, go back in time and, and get to kind of learn about the animals you love and keep and why you're even listening in the first place, um, love to hear your comments on the episode. Uh, and like I said, if you guys are watching on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, or I mean listening, um, take a look at the episode and, and uh, definitely worth seeing some of the history and artifacts that were on the slide. Um, yeah, we didn't. We didn't drop our U.S. Arc plug at the beginning, so Nathan. Yeah, make sure you're supporting U.S. Arc as always. I mean, they always need our support to help fight legislation as it comes, help keep us informed. So make sure you're a member. Make sure you're staying up to date with all the news that's coming out of U.S. Arc Florida. Uh, free membership there, so make sure that you're supporting in numbers. All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. And uh, we'll catch you on our next episode next Friday. Catch you on the flippity flip. Catch you on the flippity flip.